Welcome to today's show. My name is John. As always, you can subscribe to the show on iTunes or follow the links to social media in the podcast show notes. You can also go to snarkymoviereviews.com to read notes, bios, and other random movie thoughts. Remember, this show is completely free and independent. All that I ask is that you jump over to iTunes and give me a review. Today's movie is The Kane Mutiny, starring among others Humphrey Bogart, Van Johnson, Fred McMurray, and Jose Ferrer. This great movie covers two of my favorite genres, war movies and trial movies. What can be better than a military court-martial movie? This film was directed by Edward Dimitrik and was a Herman Wolk novel. So let's get going with the actors. Many of them are show veterans. Actors. Humphrey Bogart played the lead role of Lieutenant Commander Philip Francis Quig, a man who has served too long and too hard. The great Humphrey Bogart was covered in episode 25, Sahara, 1943. Van Johnson played Reserve Officer Lieutenant Steve Merrick. Johnson was covered in Episode 50, Battleground, 1949. Fred McMurray played Lieutenant Tom Kiefer, a man that would rather be writing books than serving in the Navy. McMurray was covered in Episode 90, Double Indemnity, 1944. Lee Marvin played Meatball, a battle-hardened sailor. He also served as an informal technical advisor for this Navy film. Marvin was covered in episode 66, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, 1962. Mae Wynn played the role of Mae Wynn. Huh? She took her name from this role. She was the love interest of Ensign Keith. Mae was covered in episode 37, The Violent Men, 1955. Whit Bissell played psychologist Lieutenant Commander Dixon, M.D. Bissell was covered in episode 30, Birdman of Alcatraz, 1962. Herbert Anderson was uncredited, playing another of the ship's officers, Ensign Rabbit. Anderson was covered in Episode 50, Battleground, 1949. E.G. Marshall did a great job as Lieutenant Commander Shally, the prosecutor. Marshall was covered in Episode 68, The Buccaneer, 1958. Jose Ferrer played Navy defense lawyer Lieutenant Barney Greenwald. Ferrer was born in 1912 in Puerto Rico. Being from a wealthy family, he attended a Swiss boarding school, the Institut La Rose. He graduated from Princeton University in 1933. By 1935, Ferrer was acting on Broadway. Ferrer made his film debut in Joan of Arc, 1948, as the Dauphine, opposite a young Ingrid Bergman. Another great film role was Cyrano de Bergerac, 1950, for which Ferrer became the first Hispanic to win an Oscar. He played the role of short man Toulouse Lautrec in the John Huston directed Moulin Rouge, 1952. Other important roles for Ferrer included playing Reverend Davidson in Miss Sadie Thompson, 1953, with Rita Hayworth, The Cane Mutiny, 1954, as a sadistic Turkish commander in Lawrence of Arabia, 1962, Herod in The Greatest Story Ever Told, 1965, and the double crossing Professor Selitsky. In To Be or Not to Be, 1983, and as Emperor Shaddam IV in Dune, 1984. Ferrer had an active television career and also directed films. I would be remiss if I didn't mention two of his lesser known films The Swarm, 1978, and Dracula's Dog, 1977, of which I have only seen the first. Ferrer died in 1992 at the age of 80 from colon cancer. Robert Francis was cast in the role of Ensign Willie Keith, the young man with a lot to learn about life. Francis was born in 1930 in California. Relatively athletic, he was spotted on a Santa Monica beach by a talent scout. Does this happen? In 1947, he graduated from Pasadena City College. He started taking acting lessons but had to stop for two years while he was in the Army. He continued to take acting lessons after he was discharged. The husband of his acting coach thought the polite young man would work well with the head of the studio, Harry Cohen. Harry Cohen had been dealing with those rebels without a clue like Brando and Dean. After he was screen tested, Francis was offered a contract with the studio. Acting cut into his passion for flying. He had befriended Howard Hughes and the two were often flying. Francis' first role was in the Kane Mutiny 1954 along with some of the greatest actors of a generation. As a rising star, he was quickly cast into the Road West, 1954. This was followed by the Bamboo Prison, 1954, a Korean War POW tale. 
His final movie was another great one, directed by John Ford, The Long Gray Line, 1955, is a tale of the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. After these four successes, Francis was loaned to MGM for the movie Tribute to a Bad Man, 1956, with James Cagney. However, he never made it to the set. About a week before he was set to travel, on July 31, 1955, he and two others took off from Burbank. The engine on the plane stalled and all the occupants were killed. Francis was 25 years old. Tom Tully played the first captain of the USS Kane, Commander DeVries. DeVries ran a very loose ship. Tully was born in Colorado in 1908. After serving in the Navy, he got his first credited role in the submarine movie Destination Tokyo 1943 and then Northern Pursuit 1943. His early career is steeped with noir films like Lady in the Lake 1947 and westerns like Blood on the Moon 1948. His greatest film roles are considered to be The Cane Mutiny 1954, Love Me or Leave Me 1955, Coogan's Bluff 1968 with Clint Eastwood, and Charlie Varick 1963. Tully did a large amount of television work including a series called The Lineup 1954-59. In the early 70s on a USO tour of Vietnam, Tully contracted a parasite that eventually contributed to his death in 1982. Claude Akins was cast in the role of Seaman Lugach, a.k.a. Horrible. Claude was born in 1926 in Georgia, but raised in Indiana. He served during World War II in Burma and the Philippines. Following the war, he attended Northwestern and studied theater. Claude was a big tough guy and was great at playing big tough guys. His film career started out with a bang, with an uncredited role as one of the boxing sergeants in From Here to Eternity, 1953. He started working in television around this time as well. Claude worked in Norris detective dramas in films like The Human Jungle 1954, Down Three Dark Streets 1954, Witness to Murder 1954, and The Great Shield for Murder 1954. He was adept at playing military roles too with films like From Here to Eternity 1953, The Raid 1954, The Cane Mutiny 1954. The Sea Chase 1955, The Shark Fighters 1956, The Proud and the Profane 1956, Battle Stations 1956, and Onionhead 1958. His westerns are too numerous to name. Other great roles include Rio Bravo 1959 with John Wayne, The Defiant Ones 1958, Merrill's Marauders 1962, The Killers 1964, and Battle for the Planet of the Apes, 1973, where he played Gorilla General Aldo. And that's Gorilla, not Gorilla. Thanks, Captain Ron. However, I feel one of his most powerful roles was as a righteous clergyman out to save his town from Darwinism, regardless of the cost, in Inherit the Wind, 1960. Claude continued to work until his death in 1994. Jerry Paris had a brief role as Ensign Barney Harding. Paris was born in San Francisco in 1925. Paris served in the Navy during World War II. Following his discharge, Paris received a degree from New York University and UCLA before attending the actor's studio. His first film was in 1949 as an usher in My Foolish Heart, 1949, and Battleground, 1949, as a German sergeant. Paris got roles in better films such as Outrage, 1950, Cyrano de Bergerac, 1950, DOA, 1950, The Wild One, 1953, The Cane Mutiny, 1954, Marty, 1955, The Naked and the Dead, 1958, and The Great Imposter, 1961, but he never got beyond the buddy to the star. By 1959, he had moved into more television work. He's probably best remembered as the neighbor on the Dick Van Dyke show, 1961 to 1966. During his work on the show, he began directing and worked on such hits as Happy Days and The Odd Couple. In total, he had 59 directing credits. Jerry would work in film occasionally, and his last role was uncredited as a priest in a lineup in Police Academy 3 back in training, 1986. Sadly, he died that same year at the age of 60. James Best played an uncredited Lieutenant J.G. Jorgensen. Best has been one of my favorite actors since the first time I saw him deliver the line in Shenandoah 1965, 
We ain't got a dog's chance in hell. Bess was born in Kentucky in 1926. Orphaned, he was adopted and raised in Indiana. Bess finished high school and it wasn't long until he joined the Army during World War II. Since he entered the war late, most of his time was spent as a military policeman in Germany following the surrender. Later, he was transferred into the Special Services, never to be confused with Special Forces, where he learned to act. Following his time in the Army, Best worked stock companies until he was noticed by Universal and given a contract. He started out with westerns like Kansas Raiders 1950 and Winchester 73 1950, and war films like Target Unknown 1951, Flat Top 1952, and Francis Goes to West Point 1952. Best had an important role in Shenandoah 1965 and was in some of the Burt Reynolds films like Gator 1976 and Hooper 1978. I don't know why a good Seminole like Burt Reynolds would name a movie Gator. Although Best worked a lot, he never became a big star in film. He was more successful on television. He is best known for his role on The Dukes of Hazzard 1979-85 as Sheriff Roscoe P. Coltrane. As he began to suffer from physical ailments, he became a painter and taught acting in California and Florida. He traveled making personal appearances until his death in 2015. Story To get support for this movie from the Navy, they had to begin with a disclaimer that there has never been a mutiny on a U.S. naval vessel. During World War II, Princeton graduate William Keith, Robert Francis, is graduating from his 90-day officer training. He meets his mother and uncle, but does not have the courage to introduce them to his girlfriend, May Wynn, who took her stage name from this part. He uses hand signals to tell her that he will see her at 10 p.m. as he is drug away by his mother. Just for note, Wynn is two years older than Francis, but she appears to be much older than her co-star. That night, Willie makes it to the club where May is a singer. If a girl tells you she's a singer, she's a stripper. And if she tells you she's a stripper, she's a hooker. And if she tells you she's a hooker, run away. Anyway, May is upset with Willie's actions. He tells her that he is shipping out. Willie tells her that he loves her and he wants to introduce her to his mother. When Willie asks for sex, May leaves upset. Willie is sent to San Francisco for transport to Pearl Harbor for destroyer duty. His mother sees him to the dock. When he gets to his ship, the USS Kane, he is very disappointed because it is in poor repair from battle wear and the men are sloppy and unkept. Willie meets two of his fellow officers, Lieutenant Kiefer, Fred McMurray, a super sarcastic officer that is more interested in writing books than winning the war, and Lieutenant Merrick, Van Johnson, who is a straight-talking, average-intelligent executive officer. Willie is taken to meet Captain DeVries, Tom Tully. The shirtless captain asks Willie if he had expected better than a minesweeper. Willie admits that he did, and the captain says that he just hopes that Willie is good enough for the cane. Willie meets another officer, Ensign Barney Harding. Jerry Paris and the two are given a tour of the ship by the smirking and wisecracking Kiefer. He makes them climb the mast of the ship as the last part of their tour. In the officer's mess, Captain DeVries starts needling Willie. Willie's family has pulled strings and he has orders to leave the ship and work on the Admiral's staff. Willie yields to peer pressure and refuses the transfer. The cane heads to sea in the Pacific and Willie begins learning his job. They drill for the mine sweeping that the ship has never been asked to do. One of the towfish breaks a line and Merrick swims out with a rope to retrieve it. At the same time, Willie gets an action dispatch, but in the excitement he puts it in his pocket and forgets about it. The captain chews out Merrick for the towfish breaking and Willie doesn't seem to understand the relationship between the two. After that, Willie is trying to get the men to straighten out and he rides Meatball, Lee Marvin, and Lugach, a.k.a. Horrible, Claude Akins. He gets a letter from May and feels good before he is called into the captain's quarter. He's in trouble for not turning in the action dispatch. The dispatch says the captain is being relieved and they are getting a new captain, Lieutenant Commander Philip Quig, Humphrey Bogart. The men give Captain DeBreeze a going away present. Again, Willie doesn't understand why they like the captain so much. Captain Quig calls an officer's meeting. He tells him about his duty in the Atlantic and that he plans to run the ship by the book. When Quig sees a sailor with his shirt tail out, he takes out a pair of ball bearings and begins fiddling with them.
Puig assigns Willie as the morale officer to be in charge of enforcing regulations. The ship is ordered to sea to tow targets for gunnery practice. During the firing, Willie is called to the bridge because Quig has found a man with his shirt tail out. Quig orders the ship to turn right and continues to chew the man out. The ship crosses over the tow line and cuts the target loose. Quig won't take responsibility for the accident. He blames a defective tow line. The cane gets orders to go back to San Francisco and Keeper thinks it's punishment for the captain. May is waiting for Willie when he gets off the ship, but Willie is surprised by his mother. He introduces May to his mother as one of his friends. Willie and May head to Yosemite for the weekend. It kind of drags the movie, but there is a nice scene of the firefall. Apparently, they used to build a big fire on the top of Glacier Point, and then someone would yell, Let the fire fall! And they would push it over the edge and make a fire waterfall. The National Park Service ended this practice in 1968. Apparently, after a fun night, May is on top of the world, and Willie asks her to marry him. She turns him down, saying his mother wouldn't approve. Quig avoids getting into trouble about the tow line, and the ship is sent back to sea to support the invasion of one of the Pacific Islands. Their job is to escort the landing crafts to within 1,000 yards of the beach. They throw in some actual footage that may be from Iwo Jima. Quig puts Willie in command of the ship, even though he is inexperienced. Merrick takes over as the captain waits in the wings. Lieutenant J.G. Jorgensen, James Best, is calling out the distance to the beach. When Merrick slows the ship to let the landing crafts catch up, Quig panics. He says they are within a thousand yards and orders yellow dye markers thrown off the back of the ship. This leaves the landing crafts unprotected as the cane steams away at full speed. The officers make up funny stories about yellow stain blues and start calling Quig old yellow stain. Finally, Merrick comes by and orders them to stop mocking the captain. He also tells them that the captain wants another meeting. Quig is humble as he plays with his ball bearings. He talks about his wife, kids, and dog. Much like Nixon's checkers speech. Quig asks the officers to support him like a family. Merrick says they should have backed him up. Kiefer and Willie don't want to support him. Kiefer starts saying the captain is mentally unbalanced. Finally, Merrick says there will be no more talk about mental illness. However, Kiefer has planted the seed, and Merrick begins recording information about the captain and reading about mental illness. In July 1944, the ship gets a gallon of strawberries. At 1 a.m., all of the officers are called to the wardroom to be part of a strawberry investigation. He has the mess staff, James Edwards, who I'll talk more about in a later film, fill a gallon bucket with sand. As each officer tells how much he has had, a scoop is ladled out. Quig is convinced that someone is stealing food on the ship and has a key to the storage locker. The captain estimates a quart is missing. He places Merrick in charge of a review board, but they cannot find the missing quart of strawberries. In the morning, Quig tells the story of his past glory when he caught a thief on board a ship when he was an ensign. He has the officers turn the ship upside down in a quest to find a key that doesn't exist. Kiefer starts bringing up mental illness to Merrick again. He even brings up Article 184 where a subordinate commander may relieve his superior. Ensign Harding gets emergency leave because his wife is sick. Before he goes, he tells the other officers that he saw the mess boys eat the strawberries. He says he told the captain, who then called him a liar and threatened to hold up his orders. This is the final straw, and now Merrick wants to go see the Admiral of the Fleet along with Kiefer and Willie. When they get to the flagship, Kiefer backs out, saying that this is the real Navy and they will not understand the cane. All three go back without talking to the Admiral. As the three are leaving the flagship, the fleet gets notice of a typhoon. The order is for the fleet to sail through the storm at a specific heading. The storm is based on a real typhoon, Typhoon Cobra. In real life, because of bad information, the entire fleet sailed directly into the storm, resulting in almost 800 U.S. deaths during World War II. In the movie, Quig doesn't want to take on ballast or increase speed, and he gets mad when he finds out that the depth charges have been put on safe. Quig is slow to make commands, and Merrick keeps making the correct orders. When one of the smokestacks falls over, Quig freaks. Merrick begins giving commands to the ship's helmsman. When the captain and Merrick conflict, Merrick relieves him under Article 184. Willie backs up Merrick. Kiefer stands silent. 
The ship makes it through the storm, and Merrick and Willie are sent to San Francisco for trial. One bright spot in Willie's life is that he hears from May. He pledges her his undying love, and she tells him it's over and done. Merrick, Kiefer, and Willie are in a conference room, and Navy defense lawyer, Lieutenant Barney Greenwald, Jose Ferrer, comes in to interview them to see if they're worth defending. Greenwald has a broken right arm from an airplane crash. Right away, Greenwald takes a dislike to Kiefer, who is not on trial. Greenwald gets right to the point with Kiefer, and he says he's just as guilty as Merrick and Willie. Kiefer leaves in a huff. Greenwald tells him that most lawyers don't want to defend them, and Merrick is either a fool or a mutineer. Greenwald takes the case, and the court-martial begins. Merrick's trial goes first. The prosecutor is Lieutenant Commander Shalley, E.G. Marshall. The first witness is Willie. They crush Willie on the stand by comparing his lack of experience as compared to the captain. The defense asks about the name Old Yellowstain. The board takes exception to calling the captain a coward. Next, they bring in the helmsman. He doesn't help either side. Then they bring in Meatball. The prosecution makes Meatball look like a complainer, but Greenwald shows how much battle time he has had. They bring in Kiefer, and he acts like he's not a part of it and throws it all at the feet of Merrick. He even goes as far as saying he's not an expert on mental illness. Kiefer made it seem like it was Merrick's idea to keep the book on the captain and go see the Admiral. Greenwald doesn't cross-exam. They then bring in Naval Doctor Dickinson, Whit Bissell. He testifies that Quig is sane. However, Greenwald breaks him down and forces him to admit that Quig has a paranoid personality. Merrick takes the stand in his defense. Shelley gets Merrick to admit that he is of average intelligence. He breaks him down on lack of knowledge about mental illness. Merrick finally admits that he may be guilty. Quig is called to testify and he is cool as a cucumber. Quig states that he has had bad officers and they attacked him. Greenwald asks about the cut tow line and the beach attack. Greenwald asks if Quig abandoned the landing crafts during the attack. On objection, the board says that there is nothing worse than accusing an officer of cowardice. In a masterful statement, Greenwald says, that no man that rises to the command of a ship can be a coward. He also shows glowing fitness reports that Quig had written about Merrick. Finally, Greenwald brings up the strawberries and the search for the key. Greenwald says that Ensign Harding told him that the mess boys ate the strawberries. He said Harding can be flown in. Quig pulls out the iron balls and starts fidgeting with them. He becomes agitated and starts making rapid-fire statements about his innocence. Quig regains his composure, but he keeps playing with the iron balls. The prosecutor and the board know Merrick was right in relieving Quig. Merrick and Willie are found not guilty. The officers of the cane have a party to celebrate the acquittal. Willie is on the phone making up with May. She agrees to come marry him. Kiefer shows up and Merrick says he didn't think he would have the guts to come around after he betrayed him at the court-martial. Greenwald comes in and he's very drunk. He said he defended Merrick because the wrong man was on trial and he had to torpedo Quig to save Merrick and he feels sick about it. Greenwald blames the officers because when Quig asked for their help after the Yellowstone incident, they refused to help. Finally, he turns to Kiefer and calls him the author of the Kane Mutiny. He lets the other officers know that Kiefer betrayed Merrick. Finally, Greenwald splashes a drink in Kiefer's face and delivers the great line. If you want to do anything about it, I'll be outside. I'm a lot drunker than you are, so it will be a fair fight. The officers leave and Kiefer remains with his wet face. May, Willie, and his mother arrive at the dock where Willie's new ship is waiting. He finally can stand up to his mother and choose his own wife. When the new captain comes by, it is Captain DeVries. Willie goes to the bridge and the captain orders the now mature Keith to take the ship out. The movie ends as Willie issues sailing commands and May waits on the dock and the ship sails under the Golden Gate Bridge. Notes Van Johnson had a bad car crash while filming A Guy Named Joe, 1943. Spencer Tracy and Irene Dunn fought to keep the injured Johnson in the film until he recovered. This accident caused several large scars on his forehead. Most of the time he covered these scars with makeup when filming. But for this film, he let the scars be shown to enhance his character. In the close-ups of Humphrey Bogart in the courtroom, two scars can clearly be seen on his right upper lip. These scars came from World War I when a prisoner he was escorting hit him with his handcuffs. This gave Bogart the tight-lipped speaking style that made him famous. 
World famous short summary? It was the strawberries. I hope you enjoyed today's show. I'm on Twitter and Facebook. You can find links to other social media and to subscribe on iTunes at snarkymoviereviews.com. So please jump over to iTunes and give me a review. It really helps the show get found. Beware the moors. Reviews of all the podcasts in all the towns in all the world. You walked into mine.